If you have questions, feel free to ask, but I may have to defer some of your questions because I don't want to get off on tangents, okay? After class, if you want, you can ask me. Um, I distilled this from my experience uh, from working in community development and uh, economic development as well as the bank, uh, as well as personal life, doing financial stuff. And the government of Puerto Rico. Yeah, I worked for the government of Puerto Rico as an economist for about two and a half, three years and ran the economics department we had um, for a few months. Um, so I'm very familiar with economic development and international economic development in particular. So some of what I'm t teaching today will be based upon my experience. Now, let's go back to the beginning of life. Back in the days of the caveman. I hope there are no vegans in here because you might get upset, but that's okay. Just tune me out. Caveman Jack. As a family, his family goes out and plants vegetables and stuff like that. The trouble with vegetables and stuff like that is it takes time to collect, right? To harvest it. So he's got to go out and hunt for animals. Hey guys, give me attention back there, please. Um, so he's got to go out and hunt for animals. Now he's afraid of animals. You know, some people are afraid of animals for whatever reason. Terrible hunter, but he makes the best arrows and spears in the valley. And he's talking to his neighbor, Dave Man Bill. Dave Man Bill is a phenomenal hunter, but he cannot, you know, some people are all thumbs. You ever see people working with their hands and some people just cannot make things without destroying them? Well, that was Cave Man Bill. He could not make an arrow to save his life. In fact, he almost got eaten by an animal or two because of it. So he's talking to his neighbor, Cave Man Jack, and Jack says, I've got phenomenal arrows. And Bill says, tell you what, let me try out your arrows, and if they're good, I'll give you skins, I'll give you meat, anything you want. Now, Caveman Jack's wife is saying, you know, the kids need clothing, they need shoes, no animal skins, no shoes, no clothing. So Caveman Jack says, okay. Caveman Bill goes out, phenomenal arrows. Goes up to Jack and says, let's work out a deal. You provide me with arrows and, and spears, I'll give you all the meat, all the skins you need. After a while, Caveman Jack's reputation as an arrow maker, spear maker, throughout the valley. And people are coming up to him saying, Caveman Jack, we want your arrows, your spears. So what does Caveman Jack do? He starts a business. What we're doing here is we're developing a producer. And here it's Caveman Jack's arrows and spears. Okay? The thing is, of course, that everybody in the valley wants his arrows and spears. He can't keep up with the demand, so what does he do? He hires people. Get a better bunker. And those people are going to be consumers, such as ourselves, consumers. So they provide him labor. He provides them products. So he begins to hire people, and he begins to expand. Now his wife in his lap of luxury, he's got all the food and clothing that she wants for her family, and a little extra. And eventually, bartering is not enough. Can you imagine going to the supermarket and trying to trade for food? So we end up with money. What's money? Money is nothing more than a unit of account. If you have a dollar bill in your pocket that says one dollar, and that's what the dollar bill should say, right? That means you've got one dollar value. So when money came into effect, the producer gives salaries, wages to the consumer, and the consumer makes payments for the products they get. Right? That's pretty straightforward. This is the basis of any town. In fact, if you look into American history, read about the company town. We found this in some areas where you had coal mines in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, where everybody worked for the same coal mine. The company provided housing, they provided stores, grocery stores, stores that had clothing. And the way it worked out was 
you made your money, and the company would charge you for the unit that you were living in, the house you were living in, and they would also allow you to charge the food and the clothing that you bought from them. So everything was in the same town. In fact, sometimes it got to the point that the person, can someone close the door for me back there, please? Thank you. I'll make sure you pass the course. <laughs> right? <laughs> Saves me the trouble of walking back there. I'm getting tired. Um, what would happen sometimes is if someone got hurt or something, the company would provide medical attention, but they wouldn't be able to work, so they would still be able to charge food and clothing and stuff at the store and for the housing, but now they owed more to the company than they were making from the company. There were some songs, protest songs, uh, and one of them, I always remember the line, I owe my soul to the company store. What did that mean? That meant that I was working, but I was buying more from the company than I was making from the company, so I owed them more than I was earning. So if you want to go back in American history, read about the company stores and company towns. Okay, Very, very interesting period. Led to unionization and stuff like that. A lot of strikes in the mining industry. But let's get away from that. Anyway, if Caveman Jack gives you $100 in pay, and you buy $100 worth of goods, life is good because you keep circulating the same amount of money in the town again and again and again. Not a problem. But what happens if you decide one day, okay, you want to save some money? Now, before you made $100 and you spent $100. So you had no savings. But suppose you decide to save 10, leaving you 90, and then the next week you can only spend what? $90. That means that since the company is only making 90 bucks in sales, they don't have $100 for you anymore, do they? So next week they have to cut your pay by $10. Why? Because they can only afford to hire you for how much? $90. And if next week, when you get your $90, you decide to save another $10, you can only spend, what, 80 Then they have to cut back your hours again. Okay? Is anyone following me? Okay, good. Problem is, How do we get the company back to the point where they can hire you for $100 a week? Well, what do you do with money when you get it, when you want to save it? You've got one of three choices. You've got to watch which fingers I put up, but you get embarrassing. Especially nowadays. Huh? Bang. Oh, before the bank. One is put in a mattress, right? You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> when I was a kid in New York, People remember the Depression when they lost all their savings and banks, and a lot of people would walk around with a handkerchief. They'd put all their money in the handkerchief, they'd fold it, and this big wad would go in their pocket. Sometimes you'd find a handkerchief in the street, and it was full of money, because people were afraid to put money in banks. You can hold on to the money, stick it in the mattress, but what happens if you stick it in the mattress? Uh, something can break in, the mice. We'll get at them. Mice can get into anything. I've seen mice get into a hole that small. All right. A friend of mine had that problem with her. She called me up. And said, hey, I got a problem. The Tussie's out. So I went down to check it out. I opened up the, the panel. There was a mouse in there. She saw it. He had gotten in and chewed wires and got electrocuted. So I looked at my friend and said, "Well, you got dinner in the, in the cabinet there." She didn't think it was very funny, as most of you don't. No sense of humor. I called it fricasseed mice. He had to get an electrician. It cost him thousands of dollars, I think. I forget. But the thing about mice is they get into anything. They'll chew up that money. Uh, a lot of people find money periodically in an old house, and it's all chewed up money. You don't want to put it in a mattress or a hole somewhere. 
So he said, put it in the bank. Well, that's a good place to put money. We have what are called financial, and I don't have space here, intermediaries, a bank. Insurance companies are a good example of financial intermediaries. You buy a policy from, a, from an insurance company, a whole life policy as they call it, which is basically a savings plan and at a certain point they will give you your money back. But it's also an insurance policy. That's a good example of, a, of, a, of an insurance company working as a financial intermediary. Banks are the classic financial intermediary. And the purpose of the bank is not for you to be able to save you money there. It is to make loans. The ultimate purpose of a bank is not to save, have you save money with them. It's to make money by lending out money to those who need it. So if you take your $10 from here and stick it in a bank, and they make a loan to the producer, and we're going to call it Jackson Company, right? The son of Jack. Everybody get that? No sense of humor. See, this is a descendant of Caveman Jack. Son, grandson, whatever. No humor. But Jackson Enterprises needs the $10 in order to keep making the products, right? To keep hiring the people, being able to buy the materials. So, by saving the money in a bank, the bank can make a loan to Jackson Enterprises, and Jackson Enterprises now has the $90 or $80. Let's go back to my original. They'll have $90, plus then they'll have the other $10, and then next week they can hire people for 100 bucks so that they can keep it going. What if you don't like saving money? Saving money, they don't pay much interest, do they? Everybody knows what interest is. I put money on a deposit at the bank, and they pay me a little money, a little interest fee. If the bank pays me 5%, the bank is going to charge Jackson Enterprises 7 8 9%. The bank always has a spread, so when a bank makes a loan to a company or an individual, but they can also make loans to people, consumers, who want to buy a house, car, whatever. They will always charge a spread, and the spread is to cover their expenses, the interest that they're paying you, and a profit. That's the way banks work. <clears throat> so the purpose of a bank is to get money from those who have it to those who need it. But again, banks don't pay a lot of money. So what happens? Hmm. You could invest it, a lot of people like to invest money. And the money that is invested will eventually end up circulating in the economy. Okay? Now, a lot of you have heard about the stock market, right? So what is the stock market? Well, it's pretty simple, actually, when you think about it. So I'm going to give you a quick lesson on stocks on the side here. If you want to buy, if you want to invest in a corporation, like General Motors or IBM, whatever, Companies out. I, uh, Apple. What the company will do is say, well, this block here represents our corporation. And what we're going to do is we're going to tear up this sheet of paper into 10, yeah, 10 pieces. Yeah, let's make it 20. Yeah, 10 pieces is good. Okay. Actually, make it, uh, yeah, 10 pieces is good. We need to raise a thousand dollars of capital. So what we're going to do <coughs> is we're going to tear this sheet of paper into ten pieces, and anybody who buys one of these sheets of paper for a hundred dollars has a share of our corporation. And this is where we get the term shares or shares of stock. So when you buy stock, you're buying a share or a piece of the ownership of the corporation. Now this block here represents ownership in the corporation. So if I buy five pieces, I will turn over $500 to the corporation. Now the corporation has money to do what? Hire people, make products, get the circular flow. This is how a corporation gets started, by the way. So sometimes you hear about a stock offer or something like that. That's what happens. But by the way, um, each share in a corporation represents one vote. 
If I only buy five shares, that means somebody else might buy five for a lot. To be smart, I should buy six shares. Why? Because if I have six shares, I have six votes. I have a majority, and I can control the corporation. And by the way, this is how uh, corporate raiders operate. A corporate raider will buy up a controlling number of shares, and they feel that the breakup value of the corporation is worth more than on paper, what it's worth on paper. So they'll buy the corporation, close it down, sell off all the property, so that they get back more than what they have paid for the shares. But for most people, they buy a share because they want to invest their money. Now, why is it an investment? Two reasons. Um, first thing is, when the corporation makes money, they will take all the shares that we have. We have 10 shares here. They'll take the profits left over after expenses. They'll divide it by 10, and you will get a return for your investment. We call that a dividend. The dividend refers to the money, the profits, the corporation is going to give you for the shares that you're buying. The other thing, too, is if I buy a share at 100 bucks, Somewhere down the road, someone might offer me 150. So if someone offers me 150, I might say, hey, you know, get my money, go to Cancun or someplace else for vacation. We call that appreciation. If the value of the share goes up, and that would be on the stock markets, uh, we call that appreciation. You can make money that way as well. So you can make money either by dividends or by appreciation. Most people buy shares for this reason. They try to buy the shares at a low price and sell it at a higher price. But ultimately what happens is when these shares are sold, it's, we're getting money from consumers, people, investors, and the money goes that way, up to the producers. Now, all this money gets pooled in an area which we call the money markets. It's kind of a loose sort of thing. Um, anybody who has more money is basically part of the money market. And invest money, investment money gets pulled in here. Loan money gets pulled in here. And banks make a lot of loans. And insurance companies make a lot of loans. Um, but this is how we get the money back to the producers. Now, you want to buy a house or a car? You're going to be entering the money market, whether you realize it or not. Because when you go down to the local bank and borrow money for a car, or you go to a dealership and they finance you, right? You ever hear about dealers financing? They're going into the money markets. You're going to be paying a rate of interest based upon what the money markets dictate, whether it's for a house, a car, credit cards. A little credit cards are kind of tricky, but anyway, that's another story. But if you want to buy something on credit, essentially what you're doing is you're entering the money market without realizing. Corporations, businesses, automatically into the money markets. If you have a small business that you want to start up, or you have a business in operation and you need capital, money, you go to the bank, the bank makes a loan to you, you're part, you basically enter the money markets. And of course you have to check to see what your credit rating is uh, so they can determine what rate of interest they're going to charge you. The way banks operate is the greater the risk, the higher the interest rate you're going to pay. So if you're a terrible risk, you're a terrible payer, and you want to borrow money, the bank is going to charge you a much higher rate of interest. And sometimes they will charge you a rate of interest that's so high, you'll say, there's no way I'll borrow money for that kind of interest rate. This is the way a bank can say no without saying no, you know. Um, but that's another story. Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay, good. Nobody running out the door yet, I'm like, scare a few. What am I missing in my diagram? I ask you a question so I can drink some water. What am I missing? Nobody? I don't know if they're going to pass this course. The big G. The government. And notice where I draw it, by the way, at the top. Why? Not only regulates, but other stuff too. Regulation is a big part of it. You want to open up a business? Let me tell you something. You've got problems. 
Go to local government and see how. Sometimes they have this not in my backyard mentality. They don't want any businesses in town. The fact that nobody has jobs in town, that's another issue. But it's, uh, I remember coming across a guy a number of years ago. He had opened up a business here in, uh, on Main Street. And um, I said to him, how come you don't have a sign out? He said, well, I had to take the sign down. How come? I didn't get a permit for the sign. Yeah, hundreds, maybe a thousand dollars on investing on a sign. He couldn't put it out. Why? Because there's a regulation that says he's got to get a permit from the town. Okay. So you got to be careful. You just can't open a business. You have to check the regulations and stuff. But there's a bigger reason. When you get paid, you get paid first. It's not you. It's the government. You ever get your paycheck and you wonder, wait a minute, this is not right. The first time you work a real job and you get your paycheck and you're looking at this thing. Uh, do you still have paychecks anymore? I go back to the days when we used to get paid envelopes, you know, full of cash, and I'd shake, I'd shake the envelopes and you could hear the coins and the bills inside. I remember those. I used to get the payroll from my department. And uh, it was heavy sometimes, a lot of coins. Uh, real pay envelopes. Then they went to checks and boring. And now you don't even see the money. But when you get your paycheck or your pay stub, who got paid first? Go ahead, you can tell me. The government got paid first. And that's by law, by the way, under the Tax Act of like 1913 or something. Yeah, we're going to have to change this around. Ah, I got to erase it. You have to get a real eraser in this. So you get paid 100 bucks, and the big G takes its cut of the action. Where I grew up, that was, you know, certain people used to get the cut of the action. And it was illegal. But the government says it's legal for us to get our cut first. So you got the taxes, nine, uh, $10, you only have $90 left. You want to spend $90. can't save anything, so no money's going this way, right? It's going to impact producers, it's going to impact consumers. Because the big G is taking 10 bucks out of you. What if the uh, government decides to raise taxes? What if the big G decides to raise taxes to $15? You need $90 to, to live on. What's that? But wait a minute. There's no money available. You got a problem, don't you? You got one or two options. You got one or two options. Either you cut back on your spending, or you ask for welfare or something like that from the government. And if you start asking for the government for money, you better vote for those people because if you don't, yeah, hey, you know, we'd like to help you, but, you know, you didn't vote for us. Tell me it doesn't happen. It does. Uh, tell you stories, but that's another thing. So you can't spend more than you have as a person. Now your kids are going to have to go hungry. They're going to have to wear hand-me-downs and holes in their shoes. And I mean, a really sad story. I mean, that can really make it sad. I'm not here to make you sad, not yet anyway. We got a problem, don't we? Because now there is no money available to go to producers or consumers. You want to buy a house, buy, borrow money for a car? Can't do it. No money available. The government's got it all. In fact, the government wants to spend $15. Now, where the government spends the money? Well, that depends. It could spend it at businesses, it can spend it as transfer payments, for example, welfare payments, or Social Security basically is a transfer payment, although they say it's not, it really is. Um, disability insurance and stuff like that, disability from the government, that's basically uh, a transfer payment. The government would like to spend 15, but it only takes them 10 in taxes. They don't want to raise taxes to 15 because people are going to hurt. And if you make people hurt, that's where you get revolutions, okay? Like the French Revolution, for example. How can they... Yeah. 
problem you don't. You don't have enough money. How's the government going to get the money to spend 15 and it's only taking in 10? They're going to make a loan or they're going to get a loan? They're going to try to make sure there are loans in the country. Well, sort of. Yeah, but if you tax them so much, they have no money to hire people to go out of business. That's what a lot of politicians don't seem to realize, you know? You tax people too much, and they're going to leave, or they're going to close up one or two, and then you get zero. Zero, 100% tax of zero is zero. 50% tax of zero is what? Zero, yeah. A lot of politicians haven't gotten that message yet, I've noticed. They will borrow the money. Now, here we have a classic deficit. Their budget is $15, but they're only taking more than in taxes, 10. So we have now what is called a deficit. When you hear about the deficit, this is how a deficit comes about. Um, they want to spend a certain amount of money, but they don't take in as much as they want to spend, and now they're short by $5. The government cannot operate spending money it doesn't have, believe it or not. Yeah. Get a loan from another country? Get a loan, yeah. Other countries will hold off on that. But yeah, but they're going to get a loan. And the way they're going to get a loan, and very good pension, by the way. Okay? And you make sure you pass them. You get the right answer, more or less. What they're going to do is borrow from the public. Okay? And they will do this by entering the money markets to borrow the five dollars. Because now they'll have ten dollars here, five dollars here, they can spend fifteen. And the way they borrow is by issuing what are called treasury notes, bills, and bonds. A bill is uh, well these are called treasuries, and a treasury is nothing more than an IOU. They will sell, oops, wrong place to put that. Need some space over here. They will sell these IOUs. Now notice the word sell. What they will do is get a piece of paper, write on it, IOU $5. You give them $5, they will give you the piece of paper that says $5. These are called treasury securities, or securities. And a security is a document that represents amount of ownership of a certain amount of money. So if I print up a treasury bond for $5, this is a treasury security. This will be sold in the money markets for $5. The $5 will go to the government. Okay, now the government will have $15 to spend, and they'll, they'll be in balance now, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, good. Now, what happens if you have a deficit every year? Well, if you have 10 deficits, now you have a debt cumulative of $50, and this is what the national debt is. So when you see the national debt, you hear about the national debt. And a lot of politicians, a lot of people confuse this, not only politicians, but a lot of people. The deficit is per year. The debt is cumulative. So when you get a deficit of $5 this year, what do you have a deficit? You also have a debt for $5 for this year. But if you do this for 10 years, now you have a cumulative debt of $50. Anybody know what the national debt is right now? How much? Something like a hundred million. No. Well, you're... You, you're way low. You're an optimist. <laughs> Anybody know? This is about 21 trillion, 22, 22 trillion, something like that. Ain't growing. That's a lot of money. I can't keep up with the number of zeros. Yeah, it's about 20 something trillion, 21, 22 trillion. It's, it's been doubling quite a bit over the years. Um, but that's what the national debt is. The debt is 
the accumulation of all the money that's been owed for previous years' borrowings. And how do they borrow? They sell securities. Now, I like to put the word sell in quotes. The government likes to say it sells government securities, but what they really are doing is borrowing. Why? Because if I buy a five-year bond, a 10-year bond, at the end of 10 years, they gotta have to give me back my $5 plus whatever interest has accumulated on it, because the government pays interest. So not only do they have to pay back the debt, but they also have to pay interest on the debt. All right, that, that makes sense? Because you're not gonna give the government $5 of your money unless you get something in return, because then it's an investment. Okay, money has to always generate money. It's gotta always be working. If money doesn't work, it's worthless to you. You may as well stick it in a mattress, it's safer. But if you invest in the money markets by, bond, by buying a treasury bond for 10 years, you get back your five plus a little bit of interest on it, okay? Because it makes no sense giving them $5 to get back five. You're wasting your time at that point. You're better off making a loan or an investment in Jackson Inch prices. Okay. Now we've got a problem. How do we get all this money back into circulation? If the government goes on and borrows five dollars, they're taking five dollars out of circulation, aren't they? The money that you would have saved over here, ten dollars, five dollars, whatever it is. We have a mechanism called the Federal Reserve. Sometimes called the Fed. And the Federal Reserve, for those who are on and on, would have been inclined, it acts like an overflow bottle on your radiator system. Anybody knows how an overflow bottle on a radiator system works for your keeping your car cool? Okay, you don't. Well, the way it works is, here's your engine. It's got coolant in it, water, and some other stuff. And then you have a bottle on the side. When the engine heats up, the extra water coolant flows into the, into the overflow bottle. When the engine cools down, it contracts, it sucks back the liquid so that there's a certain amount of liquid inside there at all times. Put another way, the Federal Reserve acts as a sponge. You take a sponge, squeeze it, put it in a pan of water, let it go, what happens? It absorbs the water. If you need the water back, you squeeze the sponge, the water comes out of the sponge. So it acts very much like a sponge. Or if you understand how an overflow bottle works on a radiator, radiator system of a car, that's exactly how it operates. So what's gonna happen, and by the way, notice something very interesting. I do not why, because the Federal Reserve or the Fed technically is not part of the government. It is separate from the government. And it acts independently to a large extent. Right now there's some back and forth between the president and members of the Fed. I won't get into the politics of it. But again, the pre president might try to put pressure. Previous presidents have tried it. Does it work? Eh, to some extent. But the Fed is very, very independent of the, of the government at the top. Yeah. Why is it got the word federal in the front? That's a long story. It, okay. uh, it's, it, was, it was started in 1913. Yeah, they call it federal because they want to make it seem that it's part of the federal government. It's sort of quasi-government. It's sort of government, but not really government. It is independent, and when it was set up, and it's rather interesting the way it was set up in 1913. Uh, there was a very powerful senator from Missouri who had a lot of influence. And the Federal Reserve covers the entire country. There are 12 districts. Two of the districts are in his state. Um, the eastern part is in one district. The western part is in another district. So if you look at the St. Louis, Missouri, and Kansas City, that's the, the center. That's why there are ones in Kansas City, Missouri, I think it is. Not Kansas City, Kansas. There are two Kansas cities. And then there's St. Louis, Missouri, or St. Louis, Missouri. Very powerful center. I forget its name offhand. 
But yeah, it's quasi federal. And I'll give you, <laughs> bless you. I say God bless you, but I get in trouble. Ooh, someone didn't catch that. Huh? <laughs> Let's go. Got to keep a sense of humor. I'll tell you some stories about that. The Federal Reserve, what's it going to do? If it feels there's not enough money in circulation, when the government comes in to borrow by selling government securities, the Federal Reserve will buy up the government securities, pumping the money this way, and the, and the Treasury securities will go that way. In effect, substituting money for the securities that the government sold to borrow the fund. That way they maintain a balance in the money markets. And if they need more money in the money markets, they'll buy even more securities. Because don't forget, we have a cumulative debt, don't we? For years, it's growing, growing, growing. So there's plenty of government securities in the money markets. Why do people invest in money sec government securities? Super safe, super safe, super safe. Banks, as part of their portfolio, will have a certain amount of government securities. Insurance companies, even major corporations, have government securities. Why? Because they're super safe, they're easy to sell, you make a little interest, not a heck of a lot, but the money's super safe. That's the main thing. Okay? And if you need money in a hurry, you put go to the money market, you sell them. So the Federal Reserve acts like a sponge. It, you squeeze the sponge, the water comes out. If there's too much money in circulation, they'll let go of the sponge. The money gets sucked up into the Federal Reserve. Okay? So it keeps the balance. All right. Any questions so far? Okay, good. Now, I don't know if I should do this, but I'm going to pass out some dollar bills. I want them back. It's my <laughs> lunch money. Otherwise, he has to pay. <laughs> you don't want to get the teacher angry at you. If you look at the dollar bills, I'm going to pass out. And I want them back. I should take names and stuff like that. You will notice something interesting. Now, I forgot to bring some of the old dollar bills. It's real. Jeez, looking at it. Look how it's this. Michael, you're lucky I had some money on this morning. That is a little If you look at these dollar bills, look very carefully at these dollar bills. At the very top of these dollar bills, look what it says. It says Federal Reserve Note. Okay? Now, what is a note? A note is an IOU. A note is an IOU. What does it mean? IOU a dollar's worth of value. That's all a note means. All right? Yeah, I might just make it. <laughs> I have to cash in my piggy bank. So, and if you look very carefully at these dollar bills, well, remember, I'm not giving it to you. Mm -hmm. Going back. <laughs> Everybody get a bill? I don't want any liars in here now. I don't want my money back. You know, life, life is tough being a teacher around here. If you look at the dollar bills at the very top, on the front side. Okay, look at the front. You must be from another country you don't know the front. <laughs> front bills. Well, is this the front? You must be a foreigner, too. <laughs> There's a wise guy in every group. I have to get a couple, huh? Jeez. Are you sure you're going to pass this course? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> Put pressure on you. Nice. <laughs> uh, life is tough and then you die. It says Federal Reserve note on it, right? This is not issued by the government. It looks like it's been issued by the government. It's got a treasury seal on the side, the left hand side, right? Everyone see the treasury seal in green? But if you look at the top, it says Federal Reserve No. And you see where well, you have a seal, like a C or an A or a B. That tells you it's from the Federal Reserve. And it tells you what district of the Federal Reserve it comes from. So the country's broken up into 12 districts. So when a particular part of the country needs money, that district bank will pump money into that district. And you can tell what district it came from by the seal on it, okay? And if you look right above the seal, look, notice what it says. What does it say? 
this note, what's a note? A note is an IOU. IOU of what? Value. That's all it means. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. What does that mean? Well, if you owe somebody money and you want to pay him the dollar bills, he's got to accept it because it's legal money. This is not paper money. Well, it is paper money. But it's not phony money. You have to accept it for all debts, you know, public and private. So if you go up to someone to pay your rent or whatever, they can't say, I'm not going to take it. I want gold or something. No, no. They have to accept it. Pay a bill, mortgage, whatever, they have to accept it. Now, at the very top, where it says Federal Reserve Note, this is not what they had before. These were what were called silver certificates. And, oops, is that the right time? There I go, they're braced. No life, they don't exist anymore. The silver certificate's a rather interesting little piece. A certificate is a document that represents ownership of something. The old silver certificates, and I had some and I forgot to bring them in. Um, see where it says one dollar at the bottom? They used to say one dollar in silver payable to the bearer, which meant that if you had one of those silver certificates, you took it in, you could ask for a dollar's worth of silver. Well, what you got were you know, quarters and half dollars and things like that. There were also gold certificates, like $20 gold certificates. If you had a $20 gold certificate, it would say $20 in gold payable to the bearer. So you turned it in, you got gold, $20. Turn one of those gold dollar bills in, you got a dollar's worth of silver. These don't say that anymore. The old bills were called silver certificates, and down where, I forget where it was, I think it was at the top, it used to say silver certificate. Okay? Sometimes you might see one in circulation. You know, get them, they're, they're uh, collector's items, basically, at this point, if you find them. All right? Um, this just says that you have a dollar's worth of value. In the old days, you could get a dollar's worth of uh, silver. In 1913, they established the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and gradually they substituted the old silver certificates and gold certificates for the new certificates. Well, maybe these aren't certificates. These are what? Notes. Yeah. These are notes. And again, we refer to this as fiat money, and what fiat money means is the government has declared this legal tender. Um, this note is legal tender for what? All debt, public and private? Okay, so you have to accept it. People are keeping you using in transactions. And as long as people have confidence in this dollar bill, you're okay. Today, people don't have confidence in this dollar bill, it all collapses. And the purpose behind that is that the Federal Reserve has got to keep control of it. If the Federal Reserve doesn't keep control of it, then the whole thing just falls apart. Now, these dollar bills and coins in your pockets, it's about 4 or 5% of the actual money in circulation. How do you guys get paid? When you get paid, do um, you get a paycheck anymore? Anybody get paychecks? Like direct deposit. Direct deposit, yeah. The minute they make a direct deposit, they've created money. And you can create money exponentially, to a point. It has to be controlled by the Fed and other government entities. Uh, for example, $100 could easily um, multiply, grow to $1,000. 90% of it is created money. Okay, and I can show you that in a few minutes if I have time. But most of the money we have is just debits and credits. That's all it is, it's accounts. And anytime people are making payments, it's very rare that someone go to the bank and take out $100 cash or pay for something, right? Most people will use a credit card. Well, if you're using a credit card, you have created money temporarily. Think about it. Well, that moment, you've gotten a loan from a bank. So the bank has $100 that you're owed. You have $100 worth of goods. The company now has $100 worth of value somewhere. So we have created money. And until it gets paid off, we have a little bit more money in the supply. Okay? 
but most of us will not go to a bank and say, I want all my cash. You do that to a bank, they go bonkers. Why? Banks have very little cash on them. It's all created money. It's all pluses and minuses. Debits and credits, basically. Okay? Any questions on that so far? Um, all right. Now, what about uh, this thing we have with China and buying goods from overseas? How does that affect our system? Because here, what we're doing is we're making sure that we close the system. We don't let anybody in. We don't let anybody out, so to speak. So the money keeps circulating, and as the money circulates, what happens? It keeps growing, and money will grow as it circulates. This is what we call the circular flow, uh, creation of money. But what happens when you buy goods from another country? Yeah. You're giving them money, but you're not gaining it back, really. Well, you're getting products. Yeah. But? But you're not creating jobs that way. No, no, because what's happening is, if China sells goods in the United States, instead of the money going to an American company like Jackson Producers, it goes to China. Okay? And that creates a problem. Because now the Chinese have got all this cash going out. When I was a kid in New York, I'm not a kid in New York, when I, when I was working in New York, I, I worked in the garment industry area. And many American manufacturers of American clothing were in the garment industry. Thousands and thousands of people were hired. In fact, um, the big push back in the 70s because of the competition from other countries was buy American. And the American unions, particularly the International Aid and Garment Workers Union, primarily female union, because most of the operators of these machines were women. And they made pretty good money, by the way. They, if they were really good at it, they, were, they made some very good money. They said, shop the union label. In fact, there was a song, I can still hear it in my head. And the song, the jingle was, look for the label. And the reason they wanted you to look for the label was because if you saw an American-made shirt that had the ILGW label in it, the union was saying, you're not only buying an American product and saving American jobs, but you're getting a quality product, and we will put our names behind it. Okay? So that was then. This is now. People are very price sensitive. Or when you go in and to buy a shirt, do you look at the labels in the back to see where it's made? You don't? Why not? You're an American. <laughs> you just put someone out of work. I'm picking on them, I know. I should be careful. It happens. It happens. <laughs> Better you than someone else. Right? But what it boils down to is by buying foreign goods, the money goes to the foreign country, like China, for example, okay? You're basically putting people out of work. Why? Because the money is not staying in circulation in the country. Okay, and this is one of the problems with foreign trade. If a company, if a country sells you more goods than you buy from them, then you get an imbalance. They've got more of your money, you've got more of their products, but eventually people don't have jobs, right? That's the whole argument behind it. How does the uh, Chinese government maintain money in our system? How do they what? How do they maintain? Because if we run out of money, in theory, people can't buy, people lose jobs, we can't buy the products. So the Chinese have a vested interest in making sure our economy is in good shape. Because if our economy is not in good shape, what happens? People can't buy. Right? Because there's no money. What they do, they will enter the money markets to buy up the government debt. So they pump a tremendous amount of money back into our economy for that reason. Okay? Um, right now, there's the threat. We're going to sell all our government debt or treasuries, and we'll show you Americans that you're no good and we'll sell. And they can't really sell everything because if they sell off everything, what are they going to do with the cash when they get it? American money in China, as far as I know, is probably not worth much. I mean, you can't use it locally. Uh, if you ever go to a foreign country try and you whip out a dollar bill, and they look at it funny, and they say, oh, we don't accept that here. Ever that, ever that, ever that happened to anybody? 
go to another country and you try to use American money and they won't accept it? Or like you're in that country and they won't accept the current like currency because it's a different province. I'm sorry? So I was in China this summer yep. and they um, have like different currencies for different like, provinces. So oh, I, really? Yeah, I have well, one. I have one currency here, but I couldn't like use it at a different province. A different province? Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, because then all of a sudden you realize how worthless paper money really is. And you know something? The Chinese are the ones that invented paper money. I don't know if anybody knows that. They're the first ones. Uh, the idea behind paper money was rather than carry around gold and silver, someone would give you a piece of paper and on it would say $100 of gold or whatever, and you'd give them $100 of gold, physical gold, and you'd get $100 of gold paper. And you could walk around because paper money is easier, and then when you got to the other place, you could turn it in. Uh, that's how checking got started, by the way, as well. But that's another story. Uh, so the Chinese will buy up a good deal of the federal government debt. Right now they're threatening it not to roll it over because when these things come due, you have one or two options. You can either get your money or you can roll it over to the next period by getting the same note, bill, or note for the next period. Okay. Um, my personal opinion is the buyer, as a rule, is in the driver's seat because the buyer has his money in his hands. What about the seller? Well, the seller has invested money already in wages, materials, and equipment. And once you've invested money in all that stuff, every day that goes by without selling the product, you're losing money because there's a certain cost of interest involved. So who wins a trade argument? In my opinion, as a rule, it's usually the buyer because the buyer still has his money. The seller has money invested in all that stuff. And if they don't make a sale soon, they will go out of business very quickly. Very much like what happened with the vaping uh, stores. You know how they spend all the sale of all the vaping stores in, in Massachusetts? Mm -hmm. Those guys, for four months, have got to hang out with all their money invested, paying rent, electricity, insurance, and everything else that doesn't stop. Whether the government was right or wrong in doing it, but just think about the investor that started up a vaping business, right? Every day that goes by, they're losing money. Because money is not working, it's, it's a loss of money. Any questions offhand? I've covered everything very quickly. Okay. Now, uh, the two issues, creation of money, if I've got time, yeah, I think, what time does this class end? Quarter off. Oh, okay, I've got plenty of time. Oh, okay. I'd be amazed what I can cover in three minutes. Two points. What is capital and money creation? What is capital? I mean, uh, yeah, sort of. Part of capital is money. What are you saying? What are you saying? Capital is like the Capital is wealth, accumulation. So it's money. So if I, if I make a hundred bucks a week, and after taxes, oops, I have ninety dollars, and I decide to save before spending. My savings, whether it goes into investment money or into savings money, um, is wealth accumulation. So at the end of three weeks, I have $30 worth of capital. Capital represents the wealth that you have accumulated over time. Okay, That's really what capital is. And capitalism is nothing more than how you use the capital that you have. Okay. I, People really complicate the term of capital. It's pretty straightforward. It's nothing more than the wealth you've accumulated from your efforts, either working by the hour, that's a thing like that, or you become such a professional that people will spend thousands of dollars per hour just to hire you. You're selling a what, skill? And that skill gets translated into, well, going back to Caveman Jack. The ancestor of Jackson. What was Caveman Jack doing? He was taking his skill, 
to make arrows and spearheads and spears and creating it for skins and stuff like that. But he's so quick at making spears and stuff like that that he can make it faster than his clients can pay him. So he expands throughout the valley. So he's making a ton of skins and meat and everything else. And the accumulation of all this wealth that he has, that's capital. And what did he do with his capital? He reinvests it back in the business to do what? To hire consumers to give him labor. And that's what capital is all about. So when you invest in a business, you're really a capitalist in the pure sense of the word because you're taking your accumulation of wealth and trying to expand it. And that's what a capitalist does. You, you, uh, you try to expand the type of wealth you happen to have. Okay? And how do you do that? By making sure that the product you sell <clears throat> is, worth, is going to be sold for more than what you put into it because that gives you a profit. Now, the profit is based upon a couple of, uh, of ideas. One of it is return on investment. So if I invest, let me ask you something. Who should get a higher return? An investor that puts in a thousand bucks, a saver that puts in a thousand bucks, or Jackson who puts in a thousand bucks. Who's taking the bigger, the biggest risk? The, the producer, because he's risking everything on one business. Investors take no risk. But his risk is less than the, than the guy that stops the business. And the saver takes the least amount of risk. So who gets the highest amount of return on his money? It's going to be the producer. Because if you risk what you have, the greater the risk, the greater the reward. And that's the way life works. You can take a very safe approach in life. Save money. You'll always get your money, but you're not really risking that much. So should you get as high a reward as Jackson, who's invested all his money in his business? You're shaking your head, no. What's the matter with you? Are you a capitalist or something? <laughs> yes. Okay, nothing wrong with that. You're my kind of friend. I mean, I've taken risk of money in the past on a variety of things. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. The idea is to win more than you lose, right? Always win more than you lose. Uh, you buy something for a certain amount of product, uh, money, you sell to somebody else, you make a little profit on the side, nothing wrong with that. You've got to cover your expenses. And your money should always return something to you. Because if it doesn't, you're better off sticking your money in a bank and getting a guaranteed return. 1%, 2%, whatever. But uh, you know, whenever you risk your money, you want to get a return on it, right? So if I buy something for $10, I'm not going to sell it for 8 I'm not even going to sell it for 10 I want to sell it for 11 12 13 14 right? to make some money on it. Um, just good old-fashioned horse trading. And this is what capitalism is all about. And it's funny because in a social system, prices are controlled. A true social system, prices are controlled. So your profit potential gets dampened. And the kind of profit you make is controlled by the government. It's basically what we call a zero-sum game. Um, but I'll get into more of that in a minute for half time. Does everyone understand what that is? So your capital here is 30 bucks. It's the accumulation of your wealth, which you invest. How do you invest it? That depends upon you. Are you a risk taker? Some people are very risk averse. They want something safe. Other people, they take risk after risk after risk. But if you take a look at all the people who made a lot of money in this world, whether it's uh, Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg, what's his name? Zuckerberg. Yeah. Um, Bezos and all these other guys. Um, the, the guys who founded Apple, they were college dropouts, weren't they? Yes. Yeah. They figured working for myself is better than going to college and working for someone else. Um, they take risks. That's what life is about. Now, money creation. Let me show you how money is created. <coughs> Okay. Now, we have a bank in town. They've taken $100. And what's the purpose of a bank? Make loans. What's the purpose of a bank? Oh, good. Got the right answer. 
Now, we have a system of control where the bank cannot lend the whole hundred. They have to come back a certain amount. Let's say 10%, $10. Uh, let's make it $1,000. So they have to pull back a hundred. So they can make loans of how much? How much? 900, right? Ooh. You got to cut this. So they can make loans of 900. What happens when the bank makes a loan of 900? It goes around the town, and eventually it ends up in consumers' pockets. What do they do with the money? They either save it or invest it. Let's say they save it. So the money comes back to the bank as a deposit, whether from the business or individuals. Now the bank can make $810 worth of loans. They have to keep back 10%, which we call a reserve. So uh, this $900, they can only, they have to keep back 10, they can lend 810. Out of 810, what's 10% of 810? $80 roughly. So now they have to hold back 80. Again, I'm rounding things off. So they can make a loan of what, 720? Yes, no, maybe? Seven twenty dollars goes around the town, comes back as a deposit. They have to hold back uh, $72, so they can make a loan of what? $600 and anybody? How much of a loan can they make? Six forty eight. Okay, that sounds good. Are your numbers right? Seven thirty. Yeah. Okay. Seven thirty. Uh, no. Six forty eight, is that correct? No, it, eight ten minus eighty. That's seven twenty, right? Is that correct? No. Oh no, I'm sorry. Seven thirty, that's what I'm saying. Seven thirty? All right. You guys are worse shit than I am. I'm tired, right? I'm tired. I'm tired. So we make a loan of seven thirty, and we have to hold back seventy three dollars. And what's seventy three from uh, six uh, seven thirty? Whatever it comes up. So let's not get caught in the details. I have started with a thousand bucks. I have over a thousand dollars in in, the, in the loans. I have created. I can go on till I get down to zero. And by a 10% reserve, a $1,000 deposit will grow to $10,000 all, all together. In other words, I will create $9,000. $9, Most of the money you have in your pockets is a small fraction of the total supply of money. Notice my money supply is growing every time the money comes back to the bank. Notice that if you add all this up at the end of it, you will end, you'll end up with 10000 of which a thousand was originally cash and nine thousand is created money. Most of the money here in, that you guys have is created money. The dollar bills and stuff, this is about five percent of the total money, cash money. Of the money supply, this is about five percent. So about 93, 95 percent of the money is created money. And as long as you can create money in a society, you can then make loans to consumers, you can make loans to companies. Okay? So we've got two things here, two mechanisms. The first one, of course, is getting capital to those who need it. And what's capital? It's the wealth that you've accumulated. The second thing, of course, is we need mechanisms by which we can create money for those who need it. Okay? Because very few of you are really going to deal with cash. You buy a house, you buy a car, it's all electronic payments, right? You get your paychecks, it's all electronically done. Right? How many have, anybody receive a paycheck in here? A real paycheck? You? You're probably the only one in class. <laughs> I used to. I used to, yeah. I was, I was probably the last faculty member of this college to get physical paychecks because I like looking at that piece of paper and saying, I earned something. But when you get a debit or credit to your account, oh, huh, oh, I don't have money in the account? Oh, think about it. How many of you really pay attention to your deposits at the bank? Well, yeah, that's... But you know, 
It's a good thing you receive a Fed check because now you know what the government's doing to you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I go back to the days with pay envelopes. And I used to like to open up the pay envelope and look at the bills coming out. Um, and then they went to checks. Yeah, okay, I'll be able to. At least I can see what I'm making, more or less. But uh, yeah, I was probably one of the last faculty members of this college who demanded a check. I want a check. In fact, in the old days, that they used to pay us once a month. I don't like getting paid once a month. So I said, I want to draw every week. Hector, where do you get all your money at the end of the month? I want my money. And then there was one year, and they would laugh at me and say, someday they may not pay us. And it sure happened one time. For some reason or other, the budget got frozen. No paychecks got deposited to our accounts. We didn't get any paychecks. So Hector Agostini had his weekly drawings. That was a heavy deal. And I said to people, see, I told you so. But again, today, how much of us, how many of us get physical checks? Hardly anybody. It's all deposited for us. And that makes it easier, by the way, to control the money supply and also in creation of money. Okay, it makes it much easier. much easier. Any questions offhand? I mean, I've covered the whole topic very quickly. I want my money back. Uh -oh. By the way, since you're borrowing my money, I made a loan to you. Oh, I guess. Yeah, very good. Interesting. Uh, 10 percent interest, the dime a piece. How many years? I make about four bucks. Five and a half a sandwich or something. <laughs> you got to think in terms of no, 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 no. I'm watching you. You may be small, but I'm bigger than you. I remember that. Both of them say I've lost them. But again. Um, <laughs> All right, any questions offhand? If not, yeah, I'm sorry. I have a question. Sure. Um, what I worked before, instead of so many companies, they have put a 1K, which is a saving. Oh, 401K. Yeah. Yeah, that's, 401K is basically investment money. Okay, so. That's what it is. Uh, by the way, if any of you work in a company where they match you up to a certain amount, amount of money, Take that match, even if it means you go hungry for a day or two, because that's free money. So if your company says, we, if you put up to 5% of your pay in a 401k, we will match you for 5%. That 5% is free money that they're giving you. Do not let it go. Okay, that's free money. So what happened when they didn't do for the 1k, but they did the share part? And you didn't invest any money, but the boss, he was the one who put a little bit of money on the end of the year of what we made. Um, it was in a doctor office, and if we make some amount of the insurance, that's another thing that we have to explain. Like, it's really long story. Yeah, I'm a little confused. But, it sounds like profit sharing. Yes, it's like a something like that. But on the end, my part is, uh, when I had the surgery, I had to leave my job, yeah. and they couldn't wait for me for three months, so they had to hire someone else. Yeah. So now, in order for me to get my part of the share of the share of money, what should I do? Like, should I just wait for him to retire? I'm not sure. Should I just get that money, ask for that money, I, or I what should I do? I would recommend you get to the investment advisor because you can transfer that. It depends upon whether it's a 401k or a 401k. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I really wouldn't be qualified to answer that question. I don't do investments and stuff. Um, yeah, I really couldn't answer that. To be honest. Um, hmm. uh, any other questions offhand? Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, banks don't have a lot of cash at the banks to begin with. And if a bank gets robbed, besides the legal aspects, what will happen is the Federal Reserve will ship money to that bank so they have money again to replace what they lost. That's all they're going to do. And if a bank goes out of business, what happens is your account gets transferred to another bank that takes over. It's happening in the past. Hey, I want my money. I'm going down the aisle. Okay. 